looks like we have everyone in here and I um, I'm so excited about this. Uh, welcome to details flowers first webinar of this like the season we didn't do one last month, but I'm really excited to share with you um, Martha Lejeski from Alaska Peony Cooperative. Welcome Martha. Thanks, Corrine. I'm very excited to be here and see some of the names I recognize down in the, the Zoom birdie bunch down there. <laughs> yeah, really, it's a it's a lot of fun. Um, if you want to turn your cameras on, feel free to, to do that. And if you guys have any questions for Martha as we move along, but I am just really excited to talk to you. Um, you're the executive director, as I mentioned, of Alaska PD Cooperative. And I feel like that you are in a whole other world um, across like the planet, it feels like sometimes over in Alaska and doing just one of the most extraordinary jobs for everybody in the industry. So I'm really excited and I know my team is all excited. We've prepared a bunch of questions for you. So we're going to put you on the hot seat about the life in the world of peonies and farming and just life in Alaska. But um, yeah, so I'm just going to just jump right in. So what is the Alaska Peony Cooperative and when did you, you start this? Yeah, we are um, a group, this year we have nine members. We kind of flux a little bit. We had two members retire last year and two more we took on this year. We do like to maintain a, between 10 and 12 just because it's easier to manage when we have um, more personal contact with each other and in our <laughs> meetings and, and that sort of thing. So we have nine members this year and I'm the sales manager for all nine. So all of our inventory is available through one person, which makes it much easier to um, for all the customers and even for our members when they're looking for something, they can call me and say, which member has this? Or they can look on our inventory system. We started the cooperative. Um, we researched it in 2014. We officially incorporated in 2015. Mm -hmm. And um, I was one of the founding members. And so I've been on the board ever since. Um, another member of our board joined very shortly after we started. So she's still with me. And we take new growers, old growers, small growers, big growers. Um, the most important part is that they share our vision and our goals. And we've, we've all worked together really well because of that. Um, we don't take every member just because not everyone has the same goals. And as long as we have the same goals, our co-op has worked really well together. Yeah, that's amazing. So do you do your board meetings like over Zoom or do you get together? Like I imagine the farms are probably pretty spread out or are they in the same regions of Alaska? When we first incorporated, we used to meet together and that got difficult because it was an hour drive for some of us one way. So a two hour drive for a two hour meeting was too much. So we switched to Zoom, I think it was like 2017 and okay. we've had Zoom meetings ever since. So yeah, we have some members in um, Homer, a lot of them in the South Central region, um, Northern Masu, Sutton. So I think if you had to go on a driving tour of our farms, it would be over a day to get from Homer to all of our members. So we are, we do have a farm tour for Alaska residents every year, and we feature a different region of Alaska each year. So this region we're featuring our northern farms. So mm -hmm. the ones that are farthest away from Anchorage, the big city that most people fly into. So my farm, my neighbor, and then our new member, Denali Peonies. Okay, that's really cool. Um, so what what is a, a cooperative exactly for anybody who doesn't really know? What does that mean exactly? That's a really good question. I forget sometimes that cooperatives are not a standard business structure because I deal with it all day every day. But yeah. a cooperative is different than a collective and different than a corporation. Tax wise, it's treated as a corporation. But mm -hmm. your organization is that every member is an equal part owner. Every member has a vote. Other than that, the structures can vary widely depending on what you want and how you've organized yourself. So you can have shares or you don't have to have shares. Our cooperative has no shares. You do get a membership fee typically and um, a like a joining fee. So we do have a one-time joining fee and then an annual membership fee. And you can organize the way that you retain your income differently if you want to just retain a percentage of sales or a flat fee. So that's why it took us over a year to incorporate because we had to design the bylaws the way that we wanted and have tons of research on how do we want to raise capital, um, maintain capital, how do we want to return money to members. 
that entire portion is really confusing and complicated because there's so many different options. So we used the UAA, which is our university, Rural Cooperative Development Center. Um, they helped us decide which plan was best for us. They never said you should do this, which I always thought was really frustrating. So I'm like, there's too many choices. Just tell me what the best one is. There really isn't a best one. So if you wanna do a cooperative, seek out your cooperative development centers through universities, cooperative extensions. Um, Rooted Farmers just had a, and they might've just closed it, but they had an application open for a scholarship to begin a cooperative with the gardener's workshop. So there's lots of different resources available if you're interested in starting a cooperative. Um, mm -hmm. Oh gosh, there was another one hosted by Slow Flowers and Johnny Seeds. Mm -hmm. And they had um, a webinar this winter about it. So you can definitely find that recorded on the internet floating around for you. And I think that there's a cooperative here in Florida for like Florida Farmer Greens of, yeah. uh, and they, they kind of all the farms here in, in our backyard are actually working together. So I'm a little familiar with it, but I, I would be interested, do all the members have to agree on like the pricing structure or how you're, um, you, do you price the blooms all the same or do different farms charge different prices for the, for the flowers that they produce? You can decide that as a cooperative. Really, it makes more sense to say, we're selling Sarah Bernhardt for $4 a, a stem. And that's how it is sold and marketed all together, pooled and then distributed to each member who sold it that way um, or sold that variety. If the cooperative is the only structure that you are legally allowed to price fix, you can speak with other cooperatives. You can work with all of your members to decide upon a price. Um, I don't call it price fixing, but that's kind of what the legal term is. You're allowed to talk about prices and set it based on your competitors or your members. Okay. And so you said there were nine members like currently in the, in the cooperative, how, how big are their farms or how many blooms do they like produce? Or I, I would imagine there's all varying sizes or different varieties yeah. that they offer. Yeah. Our smallest member has gosh, I want to say like five or 600 plants. Um, generally, I'll go by the number of plants in the ground rather than the flowers produced because each variety produces a different amount. Um, our biggest member has 9,000 roots in the ground. So it's a big variance. But since we have the variance, it's real easy to say, well, the small farms are more suited to ship for smaller orders, um, DIY brides, boutique, um, small events. Our large farm is more suited to ship to wholesalers. So because we have the variants, we're able to cater to both markets. Yeah, interesting. And I I appreciate that you kind of sell to all, all areas because I know our event planners just want to get those blooms ready and fresh straight from the farm rather than going through their wholesaler. But I, I know that when you're having last minute orders, it's great to be able to go to a wholesaler and they have a nice variety. So yeah, that's... there's definitely value in both. Um, I know the wholesalers are extremely important in the industry, so I definitely don't want to cut them out. I'm never trying to say buy direct from the farm, but so many people want that option because you can get 20 stems rather than a 50 stem bundle at the wholesaler. Yeah, I mean, that makes so much sense. And I always appreciate it when I only needed to put peonies in like a bridal bouquet, like it wasn't really... Um, cost effective to, to ship a whole box. Um, there's something new, you have a new collaboration with Plant Gem. What is, what is that? We've actually done a few collaborations with root providers. So the our peony cooperative only sells flowers, just the cut stems, not the roots. Root mm -hmm. production in Alaska is way too slow and we have no machinery or processing plants up here to do that. So over the years, everybody wants roots from us and mm -hmm. we tried to find suppliers that have great product, great shipping, good options, um, really great customer service. So we've found a few that we really like working with. Um, so last fall we featured Hollingsworth and this spring we featured Plant Gem. We are going to be working with Edelman's coming up in a couple of weeks. We featured just a few small Alaska growers for local sales here. Um, but the, I like the plant gem because they have really unique varieties. They're super funky, spunky ladies. 
Their website's super cool. Their collections are really neat. Like you could buy seed collections and not just peonies. So I'm kind of getting off topic here, but seed collections based on your Zodiac sign or what generation you're in. So I just have had a lot of fun with Plant Gem. Um, and then not to say that peonies ever get boring, but I see peonies all day of my life. And so when I see <laughs> their really fun collections at Plant Gem, I'm like, ooh, maybe I want to start growing these varieties. And so it, I did actually buy some from them and I'm going to try and probably fail miserably at growing these annuals because I can't do annuals. I only do perennials. Um, but yeah, we just like to have the availability for our followers, customers, um, peony enthusiasts to buy good quality roots from whatever supplier they can find. And some suppliers will only ship to wholesale um, like boxes of 50 or crates of 120. And that's just not feasible for um, most peony enthusiasts. So we've tried to find growers that will ship five roots, three roots, two roots, especially when you want the really expensive ones that are $120 a piece. You don't want a crate of, of yeah. 50. <laughs> Quite the investment, you know. Um, yeah. What zone are you guys in or what, what zone do peonies thrive in? Oh, goodness. Um, that wasn't a question on my list. Like a gotcha question. <laughs> I feel really bad for not knowing this. I believe it's 7B that they is the upper range and the lower range is about three. Some varieties are four. The coral varieties really don't thrive well in zone three. So I wouldn't attempt them. And three, mm -hmm. everything up here that's coral. Unless you baby them all winter long, they're not coming back if you're in a zone three. So my farm's in 3B. Okay. Yeah, that's, I always think it's interesting. And my family was in the nursery business, but I do not have a green thumb at all. And I don't think I could baby plants the way that they need to be doing to, to get the most out of them. How many blooms are on a plant typically? Like, uh, or... It depends on the variety and how old they are. So a mature plant is anywhere from three to five years old, and they might continue to increase their stem production after five, but it's not very much. So Sarah Bernhardt and Duchess are good examples of very prolific um, 50 to 60 stems is common on very healthy Duchess and Sarah. We harvest about half of them. So 30 ish, 20 ish stems per plant. And then um, red charm, coral charm, Avis Varner, they just, they don't produce well up here. So they might throw up five to eight stems and I'd probably only cut two, maybe three per plant just cause they're a little bit more fragile. So I don't harvest. Cause when we harvest them, we got these huge massive stems which takes all the foliage. And then of course the plant dies if you take all the foliage. So they're not great for commercial harvest. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, you have a farm yourself as also being the sales director for this. So that's kind of wearing a lot of hats, I imagine. Why, what, what got you into wanting to be a peony farmer? Um, I was in food and beverage for most of my career before. And then I had children and realized the hours of food and beverage are not very friendly with babies. Um, working 14 hour shifts every holiday, weekends, nights, it wasn't working. So I left my job as a catering director ran a daycare for a little while to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I couldn't hold still. So the wheels were turning and heard about peonies and decided that you can't really make a living on cabbage, carrots, and potatoes, which are kind of the only thing that grows up here. So we did a bunch of farm tours research, bought some land, planted peonies. Um, my youngest was quite young at the time. She was less than one. And so I don't remember the deciding factor that chose, we, that drove us to peony farming. I feel like it was one of those sleep deprived, this is a great idea moments. And 12 years later, we're still here. So, um, or excuse me, 10 years later. So I'm glad we did. Um, it's, we've learned a lot, even given what I've learned and the challenges we've had, I probably would still have done everything mostly the same. I probably would have planted a little bit less, maybe 4,000 instead of 5,000. But at the time I planted, I did not plan on selling my own peonies. There was a distributor available. So I was like, I'll grow them. I'll sell them to the distributor. I will never talk to a customer and life will be great. 
it didn't go that way. It, it didn't work out as planned. So I said, we need an option. There's no option. I'll make an option. <laughs> so myself and five other folks pursued the cooperative option and it ended up working out really well. So I stayed on with it and it was kind of by volunteer or kind of default, like, hey, I'll look into this, which then turned into, sure, I'll answer emails, which then was, now I'm the sales manager. But yeah. I was really the only one that had um, a lot of customer experience with my sales background previously. So it was a natural fit. And my husband's a forester, so he's grown nurseries of trees and I think he said something like, well, yeah, if you grow 10,000 trees and a few thousand die, you still got a several thousand to live on, live with. So it's okay if you kill some, it's, it's bound to happen. Just grow enough that it's okay when a few die. Yeah. Well, I would imagine the weather, you know, um, before we started the call, you were saying that winter still hadn't, uh, spring hasn't gotten there yet, which you were like so impatient for it to, to get here. But I guess the blooms will start popping once winter ends. Yeah, I've seen um, Francis harvesting. I've seen the East Coast. Um, their little eyes are starting to come out of the ground, which is yeah. great. I'm glad they have a nice um, spring crop available, but it's not spring here. It's definitely winter. So yes, peonies are still in the spring for us. It's just spring just comes so much later. So um, yeah, we still have about maybe three and a half feet of snow up at our farm right now. Um, the snow generally melts out and I start coming up by May 15th. Yeah. When would be like a, a great time for someone to take a trip to Alaska to, to see like beautiful fields of peonies or do you do any kind of tours or anything as far as that goes? Um, I don't host a field tour when I'm harvesting or we have blooms just cause I, it's so hard to cut and ship and answer phones and, and host tours my farm's not set up for it. There are farms that are stunning, absolutely beautiful. One of our members in Homer, she hosts a peony retreat every year. Um, and that is hosted by um, the floral source, Kelly by the shore or yeah. Kelly shore petals by the shore. Yeah. I know, your names. I know Kelly. Yeah. I don't That's know how many tickets they still have, but if you're interested in a peony farm tour, she's probably the best option because her farm is gorgeous. They have amazing food and they have designers and photographers and that's super fun. Um, but none of the Northern farms really host it. It's, it's just too hard to be a commercial farm and, and make it look pretty enough for people to, to pay money. But I mean, I always have flowers of the 4th of July. So my neighbors come over and they're like, oh, flowers. And they cut them and take them home. I'm just not a good host when I'm harvesting as well. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Sign me up for, for that tour and I'm going to reach out to Kelly for more information, which I will have included with this wrap up when we when we put it online, because I think that's just so brilliant. And I think uh, for florists, it's often something where you really like to go and see where the flowers come from and have like that connection. And I think it also helps with sales, you know, when yeah. you're trying to sell a product, but um, really oh, interesting. She's also hosting. Oh yeah. So Homer has the Festival of Peonies and they're I should have done some more research on this before, but it, I just remembered it. The Our member down there, Beth at Scenic Place is also hosting um, Florida, Peonoy, Peon, Florida Peony or some, I know I'm pronouncing it wrong because I haven't um, been real into the details, but anyhow, our co-op is sponsoring a mannequin and a designer is assigned a mannequin and they make yes. the type of couture out of peonies. And then, you know, they, they take the peonies off and, and that's done, but that's also happening this summer. I, I call it spring, but it's summer for you guys. Um, okay. And those details will probably be with Kelly as well. Cause she's one of the designers. Um, I'll see if I can send you the information so you can link it in the footnotes of the show. Fabulous. We'll do a blog post on it. We just did one with Miami. I think it might be the same, same people. They did it down in Miami, but they had the mannequins and they did whip from women's international, um, okay. month and they covered them in flowers. It was, it was amazing. Um, so the season pretty much starts in probably a, a few weeks or, um, our, well, field season starts about May 15th. I go up to my, I don't actually live at my farm. Um, cause there's not an elementary school at my farm. So I live in Anchorage all winter while my kids are going to school. And then I move to Willow as soon as school gets out May 20th. Um, but we go up every weekend, shovel roofs and insulate buildings and, and, you know, winter work. But our field season starts about May 15th. Our 
harvest starts about the 4th of July. Our late farms start harvest around July 12th. So our very first box typically ships July 5th. This year we're expecting July 5th as well. And our last box is third week of August. We're still waiting to see when spring, spring arrives to determine the, the cutoff date. Um, but this is another La Nina year. So it's another late harvest for us. 2019 was El Nino, really early harvest. We were done harvesting by 4th of July. Last year, I hadn't even cut anything by the 4th of July. So our early farm this year is hoping to start cutting June 27th. That's, that, it's really tricky business, isn't it? Because it's all based on those weather, weather patterns. I, you know, it's, it's hard to forecast, but you, if someone is wanting peonies from you, you know, what is your best sex? suggestion on making sure that they can get those blooms? We have actually already sold out of some varieties. Um, all the corals are fully reserved until I can get a physical count on them in the spring, just because we've discussed before, they're a little bit tricky. Um, reds, I have been able to get a lot more reds this year because Red Charm, Pollen Wild, Kansas, they're always super popular. Got a few thousand more of those. I only have one more supplier left on those. Um, Blush and pure white without red flecks are always fully reserved by Mother's Day. So if you have events booked already for July and August, I would suggest calling or emailing as soon as you can to get those booked. We also have partnered with Rooted Farmers this year um, to make our online shopping just a little bit easier. We couldn't get a, through some functionality with our previous um, e-commerce store. So we partnered with Rooted Farmers. So now you can shop by date. You can place multiple orders for different dates all at the same time. When you mm -hmm. have a Rooted Farmer account, you don't need discount codes anymore to get wholesale rates. Um, so it's been a really good partnership. So you can sign up for a Rooted Farmer account. It takes a, a day or two for them to validate your account. And then once it's validated, you can shop anytime, all the time. You always have access to the immediate inventory and all of your previous orders, your upcoming orders, um, um uh, yeah and I, if you want a weekly standing order that you do have to email me because i have to give you our our extra discount so if you want a weekly or bi-weekly order just shoot me an email okay well, we'll include your email in the in the wrap-up email for everybody just to make sure they have it um and you can also place your orders through our system so if mm -hmm. they wanted to send you a quote that's really yeah. very very convenient um so what happens during the off season at the cooperative um, still a lot of behind the scenes work. This winter was spent entirely on getting our system working with rooted farmers because they've never actually shipped before. This is their first season having a member that allows shipping. And that's the only thing we do is ship peonies. So we're, we've gotten pretty good at it. So that took all winter. We've also designed um, a new inventory system for our farmers with a new app. We partnered with uh, the university so we still meet every week or every other week. The board meets every week. The general membership meets every other week, all winter long. And it's um, after action reviews, what went well, what didn't go well, how can we improve, uh, renegotiating rates with UPS because their rates are going up and we're trying to make our rates not go up as much, um, redoing insurance and planning for farmers markets. So all those normal things that most farmers do when there's nothing to play with in the field. Yeah. Uh, do you only ship through UPS? We have rates with FedEx and UPS. Last mm -hmm. year was our first season with UPS and it went really well. Um, so if there is a location that UPS can't service, I can try FedEx and that only happened like five or six times last year. But UPS has a much better success rate with on-time deliveries than FedEx did, especially last year. So mm -hmm. we're gonna continue with UPS this year. Okay, yeah, I know we've been talking with Cal Flowers lately and I know they get really outstanding rates through FedEx, but I have heard that FedEx was having a, a bit of trouble um, with all the, just everybody, you know, having shipping. Yeah, it's a, oh my gosh, yeah, everybody had trouble last year. I mean, there was from, flowers to nuts and bolts. I mean, you couldn't get anything anywhere. So I understand why FedEx had a hard time, um, but UPS has two different hubs, not just one hub. So stuff can either go to California or Kentucky. It doesn't all go to Memphis. So I really like that there's two hubs so that if something happens in one, you got a backup. 
Yeah, that's good to know, which is, um, I, I bet a lot of people didn't. Um, so what does the future of Alaska Peony Cooperative look like? Like what's on the radar or what are you guys hoping to accomplish? Um, we'd really like to take a couple more members, which is another reason why we went with Rooted Farmers because there's so much manual data entry with our old system that I couldn't handle anymore um, product. We sold, oh gosh, I wish I remember, it was about 60,000 stems last year. And it's just, it's a lot for one person to handle all those emails and orders. So if our partnership works with Rooted Farmer, which I think it will, it's so far, it's been fabulous, then we can take more members and have more peony farms supported by the cooperative and then more options and availability for the customers. So, I mean, I think every small business owner dreams of growing, but our reason to grow is because there's a lot of, of peony farms that don't have access to a website or a UPS account. And that's really the whole reason the co-op exists is so that small farms can farm and not have to deal with all that on their own. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I, I love that, that you're wanting to incorporate more, but I guess you'll have some standard operating procedures that, and some guidelines that all the farms have to agree to. And which well, we have books of them. Yes. <laughs> and they go through an annual review and yeah, it's, that's what we do all winter is review all the boring stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the necessary parts of running any business. So I think we can all really cooperative is really, um, it also exists to educate people. So we're having, um, a local Alaska type online growing round table. It's a zoom seminar on April 12th. Um, Grace is on here and I think she's going to come to that too. And <clears throat> We do like I just finished the botanical conference and we used to have the statewide conference. So and we write blog articles all winter. And so we have a lot of education involved with the co-op because we have three reasons of existing education, marketing and sales and, and supporting our members. So anything we can do to research or find better ways to do things is something that co-op should be doing and giving to all Alaska peony farmers. Yeah, well, if there's anything that you think would be really helpful for us to share, especially, you know, I think a, a lot of florists just buy product or don't really understand like um, the way that the product is grown or the way it has to be handled to, to get the optimum out of it. So if there's any things that we can share, we love content to put on our blog. So oh, okay, we, yeah. I'll write you one. <laughs> I know, send it along. We'll, we'll share it. Um, how did the pandemic affect you guys? A little bit, but... I feel kind of bad saying, but not in not to the extent that other businesses suffered. We were we weren't shipping in March, so we didn't have the mountains of flowers that went to compost. We were able to make a new shift, a new plan by the time we were shipping in July. So, of course, within two weeks, all of our big orders just dumped. So canceled all those because all the events got canceled. So we changed gears and started offering the everyday bouquet, which is just twenty stems which was incredibly popular because it was at a price point that you could say, oh, grandma's really sad and lonely. I'm going to send her flowers. And so we shipped hundreds of those. Um, so just changed to smaller orders rather than big ones. Zero went to wholesale that year, which was difficult for us, um, but understandable. Nobody was buying wholesale. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it was, it was, it was an insane year. So I think that we're all still in that recovery mode and just a new normal. And um, yeah, so that's interesting. Why? Um, so more like back on the peonies, like why is Alaska like the perfect, have the perfect conditions for peonies? Like in um, the plants need a dormant period. So that's why if you live in Florida, they're not going to work out because they just need a cold stratification. So um Oh, I should have looked at my notes before. I think it's like 45 days below freezing. It doesn't have to be consecutive, but cumulative. Um, don't quote me on that, but that's approximately how much they need. Alaska's definitely got that covered. Um, a late season, so it doesn't combine with the lower 48 and the ones coming from Holland. It's just after. So they're May, June or July, August. And the daylight just never stops. So they grow really fast and they grow really big and the colors are super saturated. Um, Don Hollingsworth came to Alaska at one point and on the table were some Mary Jo Lagar and he's like, what are these? And I was at the table having lunch with them and I was like, well, she grows them. What are these Wanda? And she's like, Mary Jo Lagar. These are not Mary Jo Lagar. I've never seen this color before. I mean, the colors, they're just 
they're so saturated. And I've heard reasons of it's because our soils are so cold or it's because of our long daylight. Whatever the reason, they're very bright. But it's also difficult to get that point across with whites. Like bowl of cream is a very white peony. When it comes from Alaska on cold years, it's blush. There's, it's not white. It's definitely blush. So when you're ordering the peonies, it's important to look at the pictures and not just go on the name because I do show that bowl of cream is a blush peony on cold years. This year's supposed to be cold. It will be blush this year. Um, we have a hard time getting just absolutely pure whites because of that that cold um, bringing out the blush undertones. Um, and it just, it's a good climate for them. It's a good season for them. The moose don't eat them, so I don't have to build a huge fence. Um, we have a good airport to ship cargo and we don't really have any infrastructure or processing in the state. Don't really need it as long as the cooperative or each farm has their own processing facility. Um, trial and error. A lot yeah. of stubbornness has brought it to a good market. <laughs> Research oh, how, industry partners. Yeah, and I, I bet everybody's wondering, like, how many varieties of there are, do you commercialize? Like, do you sell it? There's probably what, more than what you offer, but oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. how, how do you narrow in on that? And how many different varieties do you guys offer? So I actually know this because I just finished uploading photos for my inventory app. Um, the co-op currently has 48 varieties. Not oh. all of them are still available because like I said, some of them have already sold out for the year. So we offer 48 varieties in any, this year, um, multiple pinks, multiple whites, tons of different blushes, lots of different reds. At one point, there was a rumor saying, don't plant anything red, nobody wants any red. That was not true. Everybody wanted red, which is why we're so short on reds every year. So five years ago, I said, plant some reds, get Kansas, red charms, pollen wild. This year, they're all fully mature. So we have tons of red available. Um, I try to have different cultivars for each growing zone so that we have a backup in case of hail or a bad growing year or some other issue, tractor running through the field. So that if we have an order pre-booked, it's seamless for them if I need to make a, a change. And are um, Alaska peonies uh, like a larger head size or like how do they distinguish them from other parts of the world that they might be growing in? I haven't physically seen peonies from Holland a lot, peonies from Israel a lot, peonies from France a lot. I've, I did travel down to Lower 48 to see some wholesalers um, open their boxes of peonies just so I can get a good feel for it. And for the most part, I feel like every plant does produce the same kind of blooms. Um, so we have the really big buds and we have the, the standard grade and then the petite. The grading system for the US, USDA is different than the New Zealand grading system and other grading systems. So we kind of combined what we felt like was most important. We go on the New Zealand grading system of double A, triple A, single A. The triple A are the really big ones. There are some varieties that make three or four inch diameter buds like Elsa Sass, they're just like a baseball, they're huge. And then Duchess, doesn't matter where you grow it, it's a pretty compact, small bud. So we do have lots of really, really big buds available. We call those the premium. That's what um, all event planners get. That's what's available on the detail software. That's, if you want a standard grade, that's pretty similar to what you're gonna get from all your wholesalers coming out of the Netherlands, um, big producers, they ship the standard grade, which is, um, it's like an inch and a half diameter. And then the petite, which is USDA grade one or USD, USDA standards, they're less than an inch. And we don't ship those just because they look so puny yeah. compared to everything else. They get disbudded and thrown in the compost. So nothing coming from the Alaska Peony Cooperative will be lower than um, an inch and a quarter diameter. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest fears as an event planner of florist is when you open that box and it, you know, not from you, um, but in the past I've ordered peonies and I get this little tiny thing and I'm like, oh my gosh. And maybe it opens up and it's like, a it has a little bit more girth that I was anticipating. But most of the time when you see that, it's just such a disappointment because you're spending probably the same, whether 
a oh, big gosh, yeah. palm. So I, I, do you um, suggest if you're really wanting a nice side bloom to say, Hey, I want the triple A's or how can people let you know? And or do you know? it's by default. That's what you get when you order from us. You have to specify that you want the standard bloom, which is the one and a half inch versus the, or just under one and a half, like one and a quarter to one and a half is the standard size. That's it's not what's listed with details. That's not what's listed on rooted farmers. Um, it's kind of a, like an exception. Um, that's what goes to the wholesalers. That's they buy 10,000 of them at a time. So that's what they get. Um, so don't worry, whenever you order from us, you get the biggest, most premium, whatever's available. And when it's a Duchess, it's going to be smaller than a bowl of cream because a bowl of cream is giant and a Duchess is small. So if you open a box of whites and you see a size discrepancy, that's mm -hmm. because it's natural to the plant, not because we're shipping you something small. It's just, that's what the plant produces. And our peonies are cut a little bit softer than the ones that you're going to get out of Israel or the Netherlands because they're shipped so much farther. Um, so we can cut ours a little bit softer so that you can get them on a Tuesday, bloom them um, Wednesday, and they're ready for your event Saturday. Maybe that's also why they look just a tiny bit bigger than the ones you're getting from, from anywhere yeah. else. I Yeah, it was always... Um you know, uh, just to kind of a, um, a hold on, hold your breath and wait moment. You know, you didn't want them to pop too soon, but then yeah. if they pop too early, they kind of, you know, how long should they expect to get as far as vase life goes from the, when, when they receive them or better yet, like, can you go through like the timeline of when you cut it yeah. to how long it takes to ship and then how long the vase life is? Yeah, since we have nine farms spread throughout different growing regions, we don't like to ship peonies that are older than four weeks old in a cooler and they're dry stored. They're not in water. They, the ends get cut and just go straight in the cooler, no water. Um, and that's very typical of peonies. And once they're more than four weeks, either they've already been shipped or they go in the compost or they go to a local donation, something like that. Um, you can get peonies held for six to eight weeks, but their face life is shorter. They don't fully bloom. They like partially bloom. They look a little bit wrinkled, um, kind of like old, old lady skin. So the ones that we ship are super reliable. We really like to get seven days vase life out of them. If you get a full double, you're going to get seven to 10 days vase life. No problem. It's the ones that have fewer petals, coral charms, just a few days because they have fewer petals. A good rule of thumb is the fewer petals, the lower the vase life. But if you're trimming the ends and changing the water every day or every other day, it should give you at least seven to 10 days. Um, of course, event work is difficult because they're out of the water in an arch or a bouquet or something. So they may not last as long um, when they have that expend, extended period in without water. But the we like to ship on Tuesdays for Saturday events. So they'll arrive Wednesday. They'll bloom in time for you to design Thursday, Friday, hang out in the cooler until delivery on Saturday. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's basically what we would do too. Um, uh, what, what are some of the factors that might affect your peony production? Is there anything that you guys are like really worried about, or is there anything that would affect um, the quality of the blooms? Um, we've had an extremely hot year and an extremely cold year and what I've learned from both of those is they'll be fine. The season is adjusted when it's a really hot year, they bloom really, really quickly and you harvest for seven days like crazy and then you're done. You get a lower yield because you're harvesting so fast that you miss them. Um, they're blooming so fast you miss them so the yield's lower. When it's a cold year, like this year's supposed to be, the harvest is longer. Last year I cut for 28 days. So I was able to cut more blooms because I had an extended season. They're a little bit smaller buds when it's colder. Um, and they, the risk of hail coming through to destroy an entire crop. There was a couple of years that hail really just, it annihilated two of our farms and they ended up having to retire because they didn't have anything to sell, not even one. It was just devastating. Um, but they have a, most of our farms have a pretty good handle on everything else, any fungus, fung, fungus, um, pests, um, weed control. Like you said, we have books of standard operating procedures that they have to follow. So their field maintenance is impeccable. Their coolers are super clean. Um, yeah. And, and I guess they have to have all the coolers because they do store them, um, after they're harvested, depending on when the orders yeah. come through. 
Yeah, the co-op doesn't actually have a central cooler. Every farm has its own because we're so spread out. So we have nine coolers and um, some are really big, some are really small. We have a couple backup coolers. Last year, we ran into a situation where one cooler iced over. So we transferred everything to the, the cooler that was just down the road and then we transferred it back. And um, yeah, that, you'll have to get that track it device. If you don't have it already, which is something it like monitors the cooler temperature. And it, it's, I think it's a necessity for every floor. So I mention it often. Um, yeah, and so there's one thing I want to mention about because I've had the question a couple of times this week. If you're getting, let's say, 100 peonies every other week with the intention of dry storing them for the second week, they're not going to dry store very well because they've already been shipped. And when they have that warm up period, their vase life will diminish. And so I don't typically recommend holding them for two weeks after they've been shipped. If it's fresh from the farm down the road, that's great. You can dry store them in your cooler for a couple of weeks, but also your cooler temperature does need to be colder than other flowers like it. So at least 33 degrees, um, 34, if it's 35, your vase life is um, significantly lowered and, and they could shatter in three days. So keep the cold, cooler nice and cold when you have peonies. You said, you said the moose don't like to eat the peonies. Um, why is that? What, what, what's, what? They're actually toxic. toxic. I mean, I wouldn't eat them either, but if, if a moose or a deer tries to eat peony foliage, it's toxic. So they stay away from it. Really? I, I didn't know that. I, I'm really sad that you don't grow in Florida. <laughs> um, so is there an order minimum with you guys? 20 stems. Yep. Our minimum is 20 stems and we bundle in 10 stem increments. So you can mix and match any color variety that you like in 10 stem increments. Um, we have four different box sizes, 20 stems, 50 stems, 150 and 250. Okay. Are the boxes um, with the Alaska, like do all of your farmers have to put it in a Alaska Peony Cooperative box or can they put it in their own box or? We have standard boxes, standard stickers, packing material. It, you'll never know which farm it comes from because we all operate the same. It's a lot of times too, orders are combined. So this farm and that farm combine and they mm -hmm. ship it together because they don't grow the same varieties. Um, but the boxes typically have just a sticker that say Alaska Peony Cooperative because we were working with um, somebody before that we had to ship white label with, with no logo. But they are all labeled, printed, cut flower, perishable. They have perishable stickers all over the place. Yeah, good for UPS to know. Um, do you florists need to create an account with you guys before they can place an order? If you have an account with Rooted Farmers, it does make it easier because you can see all your orders. If you need to place an order and you don't have the 24 hours to wait for Rooted Farmers to approve your account, just email me or call me. I will put an order in for you. Um, but try to get registered now before the season starts so that when you're ready to place an order, you just log right into your account and, and get the order placed. Yeah, that's that's good. And you accept, I guess, all major forms of credit. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any other kind of form? Do you do like Zelle or um, I, I think if they use Rooted, they wouldn't have to, to worry about that. But yeah. Yeah. And when you actually place your order on detailed, you don't have our details, excuse me, you don't pay, then it's kind of, it's an inquiry. So I'll say, yeah, we have it available. And then I'll send you an invoice. So you can send me requests all day long. Do you have this? Do you have that? And go back and forth and change it until it works for you. Um, so as long as they have, you know, their account with you or an account with Rooted. Yeah. E-commerce is pretty standard across the board. Yeah. It takes all forms of payments and you get your tracking number from FedEx or from UPS and track it all the way. Okay. And do you um, ship to all of the United States? We do. Um, as long as UPS can reach your destination in the 24 hours, we ship everything next day or saver. So it's by 4.30 p.m. for all commercial um, deliveries and end of day for residential. Hawaii gets a little bit tricky. We can get to Honolulu in one day. Anything outside of Honolulu, it, it can't get there in one day. So I really discourage anything outside of Honolulu. And then Alaska, we have a really hard time getting anything to Alaska. It's mostly rural off the road system. So I can get to larger cities on the road system in a decent amount of time, but it's just crazy. I can't even ship in my own home state up here. <laughs> it, that's so funny. I, um, I hadn't even thought of that, but yeah, I think those rural locations, 
I was in West Virginia and I was like, I don't even know how they would even get anything here because it's just so vast. And um, so that that makes a lot of sense. Um, is there any suggestions that you can give to our florists about the best way to care for your peonies once they arrive? Yep, they're gonna look pretty sad when you open the box. I'm sure you're used to it. You open the box and the leaves are wilted. The heads might be a little bit desiccated, but, and they're like magic. You cut the ends, put them in some water, keep them out of direct sunlight, um, keep them cool and they just perk right back up. I mean, they don't look anything like they did a few hours before. So just like any other standard flower, just cut the ends, keep the water clean, um, out of direct sunlight and as cool as possible, unless you're trying to get them to open Last year, we had like 24 hours to get these hard as rock duchess to open. So we stuck them in the greenhouse, 93 degrees next to the tomatoes. They were open by the next morning. So if they're warm, they will open fast. Just try to keep them cool if you're holding them for a few days. Okay. And um, do you have any suggested products for like peony care? Like once they're in, like, do you have to use flower food or chrysal or anything like that? I feel that? like the jury's out on that. I can't make a strong recommendation. I always say you can because it does not hurt to put the floral preservative or the flower food packets. We ship all of our retail packages with um, the chrysal packs or the, the American grown chrysal packs and the floral or the florist boxes, event planner boxes. I don't typically because they have their own stash, but it couldn't hurt, so sprinkle away. Yeah, I, you know, that stuff works, <laughs> as they say. Um, so that was all the prepared questions, but I'm really interested to know about life, like on the peony farm, like <laughs> where you live, and like, tell us about like that. And people always say, "Oh, it must be so fun to be a flower farmer." I'm like, "It is so fun. You should come join me and pull weeds for a couple of days because it's it's a hoot. It's so much fun." Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I do enjoy the a certain degree of weed pulling because it's calm, it's quiet, the phone's not ringing. I love Sunday because I don't get a billion emails and I can just look at the plants, enjoy the plants, um, but it's a ton of work. My farm is in Willow, which is about an hour and a half north of Anchorage, which is the big city. My farm, my neighbor's farm, and another farm north of me, actually all three of us live completely off the grid. Um, which is not uncommon in Alaska. It's a little bit more uncommon to have a farm off the grid, it's, um, but not impossible. My neighbor has this huge solar array and they, they live there year round, even when it's 43 degrees below zero in the winter. I took a picture of her high tunnel. Actually, it's on my social media from, um, I think it was like three days ago. Her high tunnel is still five feet deep in the snow. I mean, it's just so much snow in Willow. And so we have wells and, um, I have a huge irrigation pond that my kids swim in. Um, my farm actually is on the banks of the Susitna River with views of Denali, which is why my farm is named Mount McKinley Peonies. And then after I named it Mount McKinley Peonies, the state officially changed the name to Denali instead of Mount McKinley. So, but our, one of our other members has a farm named Denali Peony Farm. And um, our farm used to actually just be forest. And we purchased the land because it had great soil, good sun exposure. It was nice and flat, access to water, um, close to the road system. The only thing it was lacking was electricity. So we had to figure that out. We have a 53 foot insulated reefer truck that um, we've partitioned and really extra insulated, runs off a generator. So that's a little pricey given the gas prices right now. Um, we run that for about five or six weeks. So that's our biggest expense is the generator. Um, and of course all the fertilizer and, and that sort of stuff. So it's not impossible, but yeah. it's, it's funny. Um, my kids do laundry the old fashioned way in the buckets with the, the plunger and the ringer, but they love to do laundry. So they, they ring all the water and hang it on the line. And no, I mean, it's, and for people off the grid, what exactly does that mean? Like, um, there's no power. There's no electricity running to our place. There's no utilities whatsoever. Um, I actually don't even have a well, so I haul drinking water in and the irrigation water, since I'm on the Susitna River, we, um, we have water rights and all the appropriate permits from Department of Fish and Game and the state of Alaska. So we withdraw water, fill up our irrigation pond from the Susitna River, yeah. and then we irrigate from, from that. So it's, 
it just means everything's a lot more work, a lot more planning and backups upon backups. If a pump goes down, I'm an hour from town or they may not even have the right pump. So we have backup pumps, we have backup generators, we have backup fuel. Um, when you visit, you have an outhouse to use at my farm, which might be TMI, but there's no plumbing. So I have no indoor facilities in my cabin. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's uh, so funny because my husband and I, a lot of the times, I think it's called Buying Alaska or something, or there's some show. Uh, you don't have a TV out there. No, <laughs> no, I just, no, you don't probably. Yeah. But um, it always shows these couples going to look at cabins and like it's off the grid. And a lot of the women are just too high maintenance, high maintenance to live off the grid. And I just think it's really um, entertaining, but also that it's just like, I feel like it gets you back to nature and it's just a more simple time. So I, I, I really think it's fascinating, but um, we're also used to these modern conveniences, you know, I am. Um, yeah. One of the hardest struggles we have is enough electricity to run my computer and my phone. And once the generator's on, that's easy. Um, but last year was just cloudy every day. So the solar panel couldn't keep up, um, charge the batteries. And then I don't have great cell service out there, which I use my phone and a, and a data, um, a Wi-Fi stick to make enough internet to run the entire company. And it just is so weak and so unreliable that I'd have to sometimes get in my car and drive 10 miles down the road to where there was better cell service just to answer emails and book orders. And that's the most frustrating part of where I live. I'm waiting for better cell service. Yeah, but it, I imagine that it's just beautiful. It is, yeah. Yep, and my kids have grown up there with it, so they think that it's normal. <laughs> yeah, they do. You were telling me that your daughter's into archery, and I don't think they even offer that in Florida. So, <laughs> yes, she actually has archery as an elective in school because she's done it at our farm, and she's a very good marksman. She's little Annie Oakley with her BB gun, and um, yeah, yeah, lots of opportunities for kids to build swings and forts and trampolines and swimming and chase bugs. Yeah. So if someone was wanting to come and uh, open a peony farm in Alaska, what would be two things that they would probably want to take into consideration before they do? And um, do you want to owe your life to your farm? And do you have deep pockets? It's it takes like five, at least five years to sell anything. So you've got to have another source of income for those five years. And even after that year, six, seven, eight, it's just, you're crawling to get any kind of ground um, monetary gain on a farm. It's fun. Um, it's not for retirement. So many folks are like, I'm retired. I'm going to start a peony farm, but it is so much work. It's a lot of bending up and down, repairing irrigation lines, pounding stakes, restringing things, 50 pound bags of fertilizer, um, very, you have to be very inventive, creative, MacGyver, everything, especially where we live, because you can't just go to the hardware store because it's two hours round trip. So a lot of homework, rely on expertise from cooperative extensions. Dripworks was really helpful with our irrigation because they have lots of people on staff that can give you pointers on which pumps or filters to use. Um, there's a lot of help. It's just difficult to sift through what you need. Yeah, that it's, it sounds amazing, but also like a, a difficult challenge. So it's probably nice to have the friends in the co-op to like, you know, um, share your war stories with, or just like, this is the problems that I encountered, or this is what I wouldn't do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, that's kind of the point of our um, round table share and tell on April 12th is, hey, I killed a bunch of peonies this way. Look at these ugly pictures. What do you think caused it? Or don't do this because you're going to kill your entire field. Um, it's just us swapping ugly pictures. How do you get better rates on fertilizer? What kind of fertilizer are you using? Oh, I need this product registered in the state. Let's register it together. So it's, um, we also have a growers Facebook page too, where we can swap the ugly stories. And um, in the end, we come to a better solution together because we're like, oh, if you live in this area, you need coverage in the winter, some different mulch because the winter will kill your peonies or, you know, that sort of thing. Misery loves company. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's nice to like go back and forth. And I always find that that's the best way to learn. And if you can learn something from other people and you don't have to do it, it's like one less time around the mountain per se. And, um, yeah. we, you know, that's how you grow. But, um, mm -hmm. 
I have really found this like so informative. So thank you, Martha, for like taking this hour to tell us all about your farm. I feel like I'm more knowledgeable now than I was before. And it, it really is fascinating. And um, I know we all enjoy the bloom so much. And I think when we ask anybody, what's your favorite flower? Uh, peony is typically the answer. So I'm glad they have a very beautiful uh, resource that they can contact when they're looking to, to give their customers the very, very best. So thank you so much for this. Thank you. Yeah, and I wanted to mention also on our website, we have, since we're so centered on education, there's two pages that everybody might find helpful. One is called the Peony Journal, and we publish um, bi-monthly articles on there. You can find like top 10 flowers for weddings or must have reds or peonies and honeybees. I mean, there's just a really wide assortment of articles. There's one that was written by a professor up here, um, top five reasons why your peony is not blooming. Um, so check out our peony journal for educational articles, but also on the press and resources page, there's free downloadable guides of cultivar guides, root suppliers, how to plant a peony cutting garden, tons of interviews and podcasts down there. So you could really immerse yourself in more peony education if you want. Yeah, that's awesome. We'll be sure to share all those resources too, because I know, you know, when you're, you're wanting to know something, it's great to have access to all those resources. So we appreciate that. Um, well, I think that the, we're really wrapping it up here. And I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us. And we're so happy to have you as part of details. I can't wait to see what you do this year. I'm going to put my peony orders in soon. Maybe I can still get some blooms here so we can enjoy them in the details office and take some pictures and so forth. But um, thank you. Thank you for today. Yeah, thank you to the whole team. I know there's a couple of details ladies that are hidden in the background, but thank you to you as well. And for all the folks that attended, any questions, shoot me an email. I'd love to gush about peonies with you. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's been really great. Um, so yeah, we'll be getting this out for everyone soon. So thank you for joining. And if you have any questions that we didn't cover or you would like answer, please send us an email or you can email Martha too. And um, yeah, thank you for joining. Have a great season, everyone. All right, bye. Bye-bye.